and, and also with all of our friends online. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This week, we move from going to the source of our faith to our relationship with Jesus through prayer, to seeing how that faith and relationship can bring hope and transformation into our wider communities and also for us individually. That's why the Bible reading that's been set for today, for this week actually, is John chapter 20, verses 1 to 31. The first three stories of the resurrection of where Jesus meets in three separate cameos. Mary Magdalene, the disciples, and Thomas. And in each situation brings healing, connection, and transformation. Howard said it was a watery service, and I think we need to imagine the water of life flowing not just around Mary and Simon Peter and John and all the other disciples and Thomas, but actually imagine it flowing around us and so uplifting us in our lives as we go forward. In our first cameo, we join Mary early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Mary had gone to the tomb of Jesus along with two or three other women friends in darkness and grief. Mary was the first person to witness the resurrection of Jesus. Author Gail Godwin calls this kind of grief a living ache. She says it's the ache that you treasure, that unique wrenching ache that you hoard, that you go looking for, because you don't want the ache to go away. Because as long as it's there, then so is your connection with your loved one. They can go on living physically in you as long as the ache is physically present. And I think Mary Magdalene knew that ache. After all, her heart was broken as she went to the tomb in the darkness on that first Easter Sunday morning. Jesus, her beloved teacher and friend, was dead. The ache of her loss must have been unbearable, and yet there she was at his tomb. She must have known that she wouldn't be able to see him or to touch him, for the tomb had already been sealed shut by the stone. But Mary just wanted to be close to Jesus. Mary didn't want to let go to experience healing. Instead, she wanted to hold on to the past, to the way that things had always been. But here's the problem for her and for us. That living ache can keep us in the past, and the hurt can never be healed or transformed. The living ache then becomes a form of grieving, without hope, because it resists the power of the resurrection that brings new life out of death. As Mary arrived at the tomb, she couldn't begin to connect with God's capacity for transforming life. And I think that's why her reaction to the empty tomb was to assume that someone had moved the body. Not that God had acted to bring life out of death, but that somebody else had intervened. Mary was so distracted by her grief that she didn't even recognise Jesus when he appeared to her. She was so intent on looking for the old that she missed the new. She was so concerned with what she had lost that she failed to recognise the gift that she was about to receive. So the risen Christ spoke to her. Why are you weeping? Don't you know that something really special has happened here? Who are you looking for? He's not here. 
Then he called her name, Mary. Through Jesus' resurrection, God calls us out of the past and into the future, out of the old and into the new. And sometimes he calls us by name. Sometimes he calls us in such a way that we feel so touched by what we feel that we know that we are being called by name. But we do have to let go of the old. The risen Christ said to Mary, don't hold on to me. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. In other words, go and tell the good news. Let the waters that have now washed around Mary go further and wash around the disciples. But don't forget, for Mary to go to tell the good news, she had to turn her attention toward others. And sometimes if we're in the midst of grief, if we turn to others, sometimes we find hope because we are taken out of ourselves. And this is what Jesus was encouraging Mary to do. As she brought about this change in herself, can you imagine how Mary's life must have changed as she became an instrument for others? An instrument of hope. To believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to believe in the possibility of new life for ourselves not just in the future, but in the here and now. Now is the time for rejoicing. Let go of the past and lay claim to the possibilities of the future. Go and tell the good news of the gift of life that's available to us through Jesus. In our second cameo, we find Mary Magdalene leaving the Garden of Resurrection and going to the disciples, just as Jesus had told them. She went to them with the good news and she exclaimed, I have seen the Lord. Well, I'd love to know how they looked at her at that point because we know that John actually believed when he saw that the grave clothes were left to one side but he still didn't understand why or what it meant. We know that Simon Peter went in to see for himself, but can you imagine how he came out? Possibly perplexed and thinking, what's happened here? After the terrible events that the disciples had witnessed in the last few days, they weren't open to taking on Mary's revelatory news and they didn't do anything. At least John's Gospel doesn't record that they did anything. The next thing that we're told is that it was evening. The disciples were afraid and they'd locked themselves in the upper room. Then Jesus steps into their midst. Locked doors cannot keep Jesus out. They only serve to keep the disciples in. Peace be with you, says Jesus. He breathes on them and gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He then sends them out, metaphorically, even as his Father has sent him. And a week later, anything different? Not really. The disciples are still in the, in the same room behind the same locked doors. And it's hard to see really what difference Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, has made for any of them. Jesus is free, but the disciples have imprisoned themselves. The tomb is empty, but their upper room presumably must be really small and crammed with, with the disciples. The stone has been rolled back, 
that the doors of the disciples' lives are firmly shut. And they're afraid of what's on the other side. Now that sounds a lot like life today. We know what we would like to have on the other side of this pandemic, but we really don't know. And I guess there are some people who think that it doesn't really make any difference and we can still have parties of hundreds of people. And then they wonder why the police comes around to explain to them that actually this probably isn't the best idea. But what we should remember, I think, is that people are dying. People are ill. And so the prospects are, in some senses, very frightening. In others, we're called to have faith. And so I wonder what the doors of our house that we've locked and, and closed, I wonder what needs to happen for those to be unlocked. Now, I'm not talking about social distancing or quarantining and, and where we have to be. This time I'm talking about the house of our heart, the house of our love, our compassion and empathy, and also our hope and courage. What doors do we need to unlock? What doors do we need to open so that we may live life as fully as Jesus would want us to? Did you notice that Jesus didn't unlock the doors for the disciples? They have to do that for themselves, and so do we. Our third and final cameo brings us face to face with Thomas, who was absent from the upper room when Jesus first appeared. When he hears the news of Jesus being alive, Thomas says, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. That one sentence has left Thomas being called the doubting Thomas. But I think actually there is another side to Thomas and that is that he wants to believe. And so I think in this cameo, that's the Thomas that Jesus is appearing to. It's a story of believing, not of doubting. But I think if it tells us anything at all, it's that the resurrection is difficult to believe. I'm sure we can all bear witness to that. It's not just something that we can agree on and then somehow get on with our lives and maybe mutter about it a bit afterwards that I'm not entirely sure whether I fully agree with that and maybe I only agree with part of it. It actually calls us into a new way of being. If we're not wrestling with what resurrection means for us, its place in our life, and what we need to do differently, then perhaps we're not taking it seriously enough. Thomas is the one who gets labelled, but I think the other disciples had difficulty believing too. They locked themselves away for fear of retribution from the Jews. Only later did they really come to believe. Only later had they wrestled with what the resurrection really meant. Thomas is not doubting, he's struggling with how to believe and what to believe in. He wants to see and touch the wounds of Jesus so that he too might believe and receive healing. I think there's something faithful and authentic about that. It's a struggle that most of us will know. So the waters have, have, have um, rolled from the tomb 
through to Mary and Jesus, through to the disciples, Simon Peter and John, to Thomas. And there we have the three cameos. Faithful people, all each longing to know and believe in Jesus. In the same way, Jesus holds his hand out to each one of us today so that we may be healed, so that we may feel connected and transformed. I suppose we're not all that different, really, from Mary and the disciples. We, too, look for evidence that the Gospel story is true. It reveals our struggle and our desire to believe. It also reveals our misunderstanding of faith and the resurrection. Resurrection is not a case to be proved. It's a life to be lived. It's a life to share. It's a life to experience, not just on our own, but collectively with each other. Every time we live in the power of the resurrection, we engage with the world, with one another. And hopefully we live our life in a different way. We move from saying, unless something happens, to asking, come Lord Jesus. It's my prayer today that the living waters will flow around you and your families, whether you're here in this church or whether you're somewhere online in your own homes. May the Lord bless each one of you and may the waters give you living hope. In the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.